We have a crisis in leadership in the world today, and it's not a crisis in a single corporation or a single job or, or any single person. It's a crisis in how we think about leadership, what leaders do. Pop quiz. Where have you seen this script before? America goes to war, negotiates peace, withdraws troops, slashes aim, and then looks the other way as its old enemies start to take over. I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with Vietnam. Hi, I'm Ian Brimmer. This is Moose the Dog, and welcome to G Zero World. Today, we'll dig into the only American war that lasted longer than not and then explain why history has a way of repeating itself. I'm of course talking about Afghanistan. And who better to explain it than the man who was once there and commanding more than 100,000 US troops, and no Norfolk Terriers, former four-star general Stanley McChrystal is here. And of course, I've also got your puppet regime. With her around, this house is no longer a home for me. Uh, not since January it's not. This is now my house, Donald. But first, a word from the folks who helped me and Moose keep the lights on. Major corporate funding provided by founding sponsor, First Republic. At First Republic, our clients come first. Taking the time to listen helps us provide customized banking and wealth management solutions. More on our clients at firstrepublic.com. Funding also provided by Harold J. Newman. These long wars will come to a responsible end. Great nations do not fight endless wars. I want to talk to you about promises. There's been more than a few made when it comes to the war in Afghanistan. Let's start in 2001, when George W. Bush offered this one while atop the rubble in Manhattan's financial district. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people, and the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Now fast forward to 2008, Barack Obama campaigned on escalating the conflict. We cannot lose Afghanistan. This is a war we have to win. Of course, he later tried to end it. It is time to focus on nation building here at home. But still, the war continued. And so the baton was passed to Donald J. Trump, whose promises of homecoming were ironically not all that different from Obama in his later years. We've hit him very hard, but it's been 19 years. Think of that, 19 years. We spend more on military in Afghanistan, $50 billion a year, than most countries spend on their entire country. Okay, it hasn't quite been 19 years, but the point is very little has changed. Yes, Afghanistan has made some major improvements since 2001. Women lawmakers now fill parliament, but America still has thousands of troops in the country. The Afghan government is still weak and holds very little of its territory, and American soldiers are still coming home in body bags. Meanwhile, US leaders are keen to focus elsewhere. Where else does that sound familiar? We have children to teach, and we have sick to be cured and we have men to be free. There are poor to be lifted up, and there are cities to be built, and there's a world to be helped. Yet, we do what we must. Now remember, these are two very different wars. Afghanistan, of course, never faced Vietnam's public backlash, and Afghanistan was a direct response to terrorist attacks on American soil, unlike in Vietnam, which was a gradual escalation in the global fight against communism. But in both cases, the big talk of leaving occurred only after America's enemies made serious gains. Intelligence reports have confirmed that regular North Vietnam Army troops have infiltrated the South. In September 2005, 
it was clear to me then that the Taliban were beginning their comeback. And guess what? In both wars, the lack of a U.S. exit strategy also dovetailed with talk of peace. There are some who believe that to continue our withdrawals at a time when enemy infiltration is increasing is a risk we should not take. However, I have consistently said we must take risks for peace. After two decades of war, the hour has come to at least try for peace. And the other side would like to do the same thing. It's time. Like in Vietnam, Afghanistan shows the limits of American power. I mean, everyone in the region knows the United States does not want to stay forever. That internal opposition means the longer that opposition forces can hold on, the more likely the Americans will cut and run. Also, there's been changing strategies. What are the Americans trying to accomplish? Mission creep on the ground. When the Americans started the war, it was to fight the Taliban. Now, we're engaging with the Taliban diplomatically, and any political solution will include Taliban governance on the ground in Afghanistan. But here's what's different compared to a previous U.S. administrations. American diplomats now meet directly with their Taliban counterparts, and they've also come up with a draft framework that includes an American withdrawal and a Taliban promise not to allow terrorist groups into their country. For the most part, these meetings have been shrouded in secrecy. But for today's show, we've unearthed some rare unseen footage. Have a look. Uh, yes, is that the uh, Taliban? Yes. Hey, how's it going? Watch this, watch this. Uh, Taliban, this war has gone on for too long, and I am going to make you an offer that you cannot refuse. Yeah, is that the same offer where we keep Afghanistan and you go home with nothing? Yes, that is the offer. The art of the deal. You still there? So I think what we've done is we've created an environment and they are adapting to that environment. What is our national interest? How much of that is practical? How much of that is moral? General Stanley McChrystal, wonderful to be with you. Thank you well, it's much. a pleasure. Thanks for having me. So uh, I'll jump into the new book, uh, Leaders, Myth, and Reality. Uh, have you decided which one of those two you actually are? Well, I think there's a little of both <laughs> in all of us. Uh, but really to get at it, I think the problem is the myth. We have a crisis in leadership in the world today, and it's not a crisis in a single corporation or a single job or, or any single person. It's a crisis in how we think about leadership, what leaders do. And that's really brought upon by my research and contemplation on it in the last few years because we look at it mythologically. We put leaders on pedestals. We, for lots of reasons, believe that leaders, if they are thrifty, brave, clean, reverent, and follow a set of attributes or behaviors, are going to be good leaders. But in fact, data tells us that's not the case. In many cases, someone with none of those attributes is far more successful. We also follow leaders that, in many cases, take us exactly where we don't want or need to go. Does data tell you something different than your personal experience in terms of what makes a good leader in the world today? Well, data tells me something different from what I was taught, and I think most of us are taught. We have a belief that there are certain things that leaders are, certain things that leaders do. And yet our experience also runs counter to that. I grew up loving history, studied Robert E. Lee, and here he was almost the prototypical perfect leader in many ways, yet he lost to Sam Grant sort of a grubby, much less impressive army officer earlier in his career. And so what happens is, and what caused me to be interested in this subject and to, to take this book on, was there was a disconnect. There was all the things that I had thought about leadership, the things I'd been taught, the things I tried to be as a leader, and yet they were disconnected from the actual outcome of how leadership actually plays out in the real world. Now, I, I want to turn, if I can, to some of your specific life experience. Yeah. You commanded our forces in Afghanistan. Yeah. Not easy service. What are we doing there? 
Well, you have to go back to uh, what did we think we were doing? And if you go back to the 1960s and 1970s, Afghanistan was really at play in the Cold War. Sure. In the early 1970s, the Soviets got a bigger hand in Afghanistan starting in 73, and of course they intervened in 1979. Mm -hmm. They began a 10-year war. And during that 10-year war, we famously gave money and weapons, mostly through mm -hmm. the Pakistanis, the other side, yeah. to the Mujahideen, the seven groups. During that period, we were successful. And I say we, so much there's the famous facts at the end of the war that says we won. We gave the Soviet Union their Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Well, what really happened is the Afghan people lost 1.2 million people in a bitter war. And at the end of that period, where we sort of patted ourselves on the back for what we had done, they had suffered this amazing loss and we turned and looked elsewhere. And now Afghanistan, in the wreckage of that, lurches into a civil war. The seven Mujahideen groups and then in 1994, the rise of the Taliban. And so the tattered country, the society is now sort of turned upside down and inside out. Then we went back in 2001. And people used to come to me and say, we went back because the Afghans asked us to. No, we didn't. We went back because 9-11 and it was in our interest to go back. We went back and in, in going after Al Qaeda, we toppled the government of the Taliban. Hmm. Now you've got this broken country, and the Taliban are It was born. broken before. That's right, it was broken before, now it's literally ungoverned. Mm -hmm. And so now the United States and the West decide, well, what do we do with this? And there seemed to be a moral and a practical need to try to help the Afghans put it together again. But it wasn't as easy because it had now been more than 20 years of chaos and war. Society wasn't what it was. Warlords had become extraordinarily powerful. So as a consequence, I think we sort of backed into saying, well, we got Al-Qaeda out, but we don't want Al-Qaeda to come back in, so we've got to create a nation that can at least survive. And for the first seven or eight years, we did it, but we didn't do it very seriously. We didn't put a lot of resources in there. The countries that said that they would do the courts and the police and the military never really bellied up to the bar and did that. So by 2008 and 9. I mean, there were some stories about infrastructure getting built, about yeah. women getting educated, but you wouldn't say it was governed. I wouldn't say it was governed. I wouldn't say there was all that much built or done. When we actually compare the level of investment during that eight year period and the level of effective investment, it was pretty modest. Mm -hmm. And the Afghan government by 2008 and 9, although it had been formed with, uh, at Bonn, it was not really representative across the country. And this is when you said some 10 years ago that if we didn't significantly up our presence, right. that we were ultimately going to fail in Afghanistan. Right. If our mission, as it was outlined to me, was to produce a nation that was capable of protecting its sovereignty and therefore preventing potential safe haven of groups like Al Qaeda, if that was the mission, if that was the US national interest, then we had to up our game there so that we could give the opportunity for the Afghan security forces to mature and for the Afghan government to be strong enough to do that. So here we are in 2019, and we're 18 years in, and yeah. Trump says he wants these troops out by 2020. Yeah. The country no closer to that idea of a functional governing nation than it was before, while we're negotiating with the Taliban with the support of the Qatari government. Um, Leaving aside whether that initial mission was a good idea or not, given where we are now, yeah, right. uh, do you support these talks? Do you think Trump is right to want to get out? Well, here's our question. What's our national interest now? What is our national interest? How much of that is practical? How much of that is moral? And how what, much of it is doable? Well, that's exactly right. What, what do we want or desire Afghanistan can be? Now, I personally believe that that means ultimately it's gotta have Taliban representation in that government. Mm -hmm. They are part of the society. As long as they are outside, you're gonna have a long-term problem. So negotiating with them is a critical component of anything. It has to be. The road to an accommodation has to go there. Then the question is, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Does it look like Vietnam at the end of the war where we basically have a decent interval and then allow the North to uh, win? Or are we really trying to do a negotiation that hits some kind of balance in which the, the interests of the different part of the country are represented? So how has war fighting changed over the last 
18 years? Yeah. How is it different for on the ground? How is it changing the ability of the Americans to have strategic advantage or not? Yeah. First off, the obvious part is technology allows you to use much smaller forces, much greater precision, much greater speed, much greater understanding of not the big picture what's happening, but the micro things. You can find an enemy vehicle, you can do this. What hasn't changed in that regard is the will of the people and the activities of the people still trump all of that. They still are more important than the military forces running around because at the end of the day, what the people decide is what happens. They don't always understand that, but, but that's what happens. The other part that has changed, and it's not new, it's just in a different proportion, is the use of information. Mm -hmm. um, Al Qaeda used information from its earliest days to build an initial element, and then 9 11 was a large psychological operation to upset the West, and it did that and established their credibility. Al Qaeda in Iraq was an information technology enabled organization that was rapid, it was constantly adapting, it could learn on a level that I've never seen a corporation be able to do it and apply lessons as they did because they were really extraordinary. How so? Well, they could do an operation in Mosul and they could have success or failure and you'd see the effects of what happened there in the learnings of how they operated across Iraq the next day. Example? How car bombs were done, how propaganda was put out. Time and time again, or when we developed technology. So they had Six Sigma, the, the uh, Al Qaeda. That's pretty without impressive. Know, without knowing that they had it. Mm -hmm. It was an organic form of that. And so part of that, driven by the fact that as we pressured them, obviously the dumb ones got killed, the smart ones survived, and therefore you're, you're doing a Darwinistic improvement of the, of the uh, organization. But the reality is they got better and better as they went. ISIS took it to a social media level, which Al Qaeda in Iraq did. Now, ISIS was an idea that had a military arm to it. And the power of ISIS is the ability to come up with that idea, keep it unified, propagate that idea out, and do it over and over again. The things we saw that we mistook as military operations in many cases were really good information operations. So as a consequence, Al Qaeda is disproportionately healthy now, even after militarily being battered for several years. So the fact that there's no caliphate and the fact that their military has been pretty much wiped out in Syria and Iraq, you still think ISIS as an organization is quite capable? I think it is. And I think it has the ability to regenerate those physical things relatively quickly. Do we know how to fight that? Well, we have not yet demonstrated the effectiveness of doing it. Wars start for, for big reasons of national interests, and then when you kill somebody's brother or you kill comrades, people are fighting a lot because of the brother and comrade, not because of they wanna liberate the Straits of Acts. Uh, and so, for the force, the force sort of puts its heads down. The force doesn't spend an awful lot of time talking about the geopolitical nuances of whether this is right or that's right. It's too hard to do that. It's, it's asking too much of the force to go through this constant moral quandary over what's right and wrong. So it, when you're on the ground yeah. experiencing that, yeah. I mean, how much are you just saying, this is what's motivating my troops? I can't fight that. Well, that's where leadership comes in. Because quite honestly, a commander in most cases can get their organization to do almost anything you want them to do if you're a reasonably competent commander, if I'm convinced that I got in front of my forces and I'd said, no prisoners, no quarter, that for a lot of my force, they would have said, all right, that's what we'll do. It's not because they're bad people. Mm -hmm. It's not because they lack morals. It's because that's the dynamic of forces. And that's where leadership is so important because leadership has got to raise the force. It's got to put the force on a moral foundation it's got to tell the force what's important. And, and usually those values reflect what the soldier has grown up with. It's got to remind you of them. In Iraq, as we were fighting, we would go into these torture chambers. Literally, we would clear a building and go in the basement, and there would be a medieval-looking torture chamber. I thought I'd seen things in the world, and, and when you see the first one of these, it just sickens your stomach. But it also makes you angry. And it also says, well, i got to kill these people. And as you simplify that, you can suddenly think of what, I think it was Bull Halsey at a big uh, 
sign outside one of the ports in the Southwest Pacific that said, kill Japs, kill more Japs. And that was a billboard that every ship going out of the harbor saw. Now, if we saw that today, we'd go, wow, that, that doesn't feel right. But if we'd seen it on the 10th or 12th or 13th of November or uh, September 2001, a lot of people would have said, yeah. So you have to understand there's this instinct. And Bush responded instinct. very differently. He did. After 9-11. I mean, this is a president who said Islam is love. That's right. I consider Bin Laden an evil man. And uh, I don't think there's any religious justification for what he has in mind. Islam is a religion of love, not hate. And that was the right thing to do. It would have been so easy for him to go, we hate those people, let's get them. I mean, that would have been an applause line. And the reality is what leaders have got to do is make us better than we would otherwise be. Okay, now you're supposed to be a role model mm -hmm. as a four star, um, but I've been told uh, ever since I was a child that a good day starts with breakfast. Yeah. You do not eat breakfast right. or lunch. Right. Just dinner. Right. Every day. Right. What's wrong with you? Yeah, <laughs> lots of things, that's only one. But no, but specifically, this seems almost obscene. Yeah, when I was a young officer, I thought I was getting pudgy. And I don't have the self-discipline to sit down and eat a small meal. You ever been around people who can sit down and they can eat this very uh, small In Manhattan meal? every evening, yes. I yes. can't do that. You can't do that. So I have to eat everything my arms can reach. And so what I found was I can defer gratitude sort of to the end of the day. If I just sort of go through the day, take my head down, work, 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 at the end of the day, I feel I can eat whatever I want. I weigh right now two pounds less than the day I reported to West Point. Which is? 176. Very nice, okay, and you're like 5'10"? 6'1". 6'1", okay, so you look. But I'm shrinking. Okay, fair enough. Oh. So that's pretty impressive. Well. It, it doesn't matter except that it's a goal I set for myself. Yeah. And so the reality but are you is. Starving by dinner time? Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm gnawing on and my you, forearm. And you're just okay. You're just okay. Yeah. I mean I Does that allow you to just put more nervous energy into your work? I mean, I would think the wife, because here's the thing. You know Daniel Kahneman, right? Yeah. The great psychologist. Yeah. And, and he actually they do these studies, right, in Israel about how the um, prior to lunch when people are hungry, cases that go to jury, everyone's guilty because they're angry. But well, why do you, I'm, I'm, how do you, you can't exactly have courageous restraint when you want to gnaw your arm off, right? Yeah, it's an interesting point. You, well, one, I think you can, because I think there's a lot of discipline. But I also think that if somebody is sort of comfortable all the time, I don't think you accomplish all that much. If I was just sort of lazed around, comfortable, fill belly, I don't think I would have a lot of focused energy. I think there's a certain amount to be said for being a little bit cold, a little bit tired, a little bit hungry. I think that can sharpen you. Well, you're certainly that. General, Stan McChrystal, great Thank to see you. My pleasure, thank you. And now for something completely different, even though we show it to you Every week, I have your puppet regime. Okay, you two. I'm glad you're here for some therapy. The fate of the American government depends on fixing this relationship. Let's begin. Look, I just feel that I am not seen in this relationship, okay? I am not acknowledged. I am not seen. Oh, Donald, what do you mean? You'll be seen. We'll be seeing your tax returns, your business records, your dealings with Russia. <laughs> Look, she's impossible, okay? With her around, this house is no longer a home for me. Uh, not since January, it's not. This is now my house, Donald. Get used to it. Okay, okay, let's focus on specifics. Sometimes money can be an issue in relationships. Donald? Donald? You see, when he doesn't get what he wants, he just shuts down. Impossible. I did not shut down. She shut down. I have, as you know, done more than any president in history for our great country, which was very bad, a disgrace when I first became president. And as you know, and so on, and yes. Okay, look, both of you have beaten tremendous odds to get where you are today. Neither of you wants these young socialists to get any more popular. Is there any common ground you can find? 
Well, you're right. I suppose we could try to find a way to address these barriers between us. Uh, yes, Nancy, we can. They just can't be barriers. They have to be a wall. What? Not this again, well, Donald. I told there is you. no Look, I told way. You. You should never give me what I this want. This is just okay? outrageous. Just all right, you just have to a drop total, it, Donald. Just disgrace. drop it. It's this not going to happen. All right? Just very leave unfair, it alone. Sad and awful. You okay. can't. And that's our show this week. Come back next week if you like it. Please do. I, I miss you. If you're not here, I, I, somehow I can feel it. There aren't as many people watching. Stay. And if you want to watch in the interim, or you just want to see what's going on, you want to fan out on all things G Zero World, check us out on gzeromedia.com. Until then, I'm Ian. Moose says bye. Major corporate funding provided by founding sponsor, First Republic. At First Republic, our clients come first. Taking the time to listen helps us provide customized banking and wealth management solutions. More on our clients at firstrepublic.com. Funding also provided by Harold J. Newman.